conocen el sistema, cada uno de nosotros vamos a estar en una de las puertas entregando los, los boletos para la comida. Entonces, uh, whenever you're ready, Scott. Okay. Yeah. Muchas gracias. Thanks for coming back. So the obvious joke is I talked about fires and there was a fire here. <laughs> and now I'm talking about volcanoes. <laughs> um, fortunately, this fire was not detectable from Go 16. And, uh, and I know you're also thinking, oh, he's talking again. Um, but. The, the one thing I really like to do is talk about satellite imagery. I love water vapor imagery, too. So um, I'm really happy to be able to do this. I thank you for your attention. And uh, on we go. This is my last talk. So you know who I am by now. Um, Matt Gunshore and Scott Bachmeyer are people I work with, and Tim Schmidt is with NOAA, but in my building. So we are a cooperative institute with people from the university, such as me, and people from the federal government. That'd be Tim Schmidt. So <coughs> the topic today, the last topic I'm going to be talking about is the water vapor channels. Something to tell you about atmospheric moisture. There have been a couple of questions about that. Um, and also, how is volcanic activity detected? So you'll better understand moisture observations from the satellite when you're done with this. Uh, know how sulfur di sulfuric detection detect sulfuric acid detection is difficult for volcanoes, principally because there's a lot of water vapor there too. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about weighting functions. I touched on them yesterday because I think it's important to understand them, to know, to, to understand where the signal in the, ABI, in the ABI water vapor channel is coming from in the vertical. So this, I hope, is a review. There are three water vapor channels. As I say, there are three infrared water vapor channels. Of course, there's a near-infrared water vapor channel to the 1.38, where there's a lot of water vapor absorption. Um, so we have these have been nicknamed 6.19 is the upper-level water vapor, 6.95 is the mid-level water vapor, and not very originally, 7.34 is the low-level water vapor. So the question, of course, is what level is really being referenced here? Um, it varies with moisture. So you've seen this, you saw this yesterday. So here again, we have the three, the three water vapor channels with more uh, water vapor absorption in the, in the 6.19 channel, which is also a little bit broader, um, and progressively less water vapor absorption in the 6.95 and the 7.34. Notice the 7.34 is a little more narrow as well. Typically, as these channels get broader, you're sampling a bigger depth of the atmosphere. So the 6.19 is sampling a pretty big depth of the atmosphere because it's a broad channel. And when you have a more narrow channel, it's looking at a, at a, a uh, vertically more compressed region of the atmosphere. So again, something you saw yesterday, the spectral response functions, and also what the satellite would be detecting at all these different wavelengths if it was above a U.S. standard atmosphere in clear skies. Of course, if it's cloudy, you're just going to be seeing something that's around here. So um, this is a clear sky computation. <coughs> the brightness temperature difference that's solely due to water vapor is shown here. So we've taken the completely dry atmosphere, computed this temperature, and then did this, done the same thing with, a, uh, with water vapor and, and done the subtraction. And again, just to reinforce the notion that each of these channels has some cooling that's due to water vapor. Um, the 10.3 is, is fairly clean. 9.6 is pretty clean too, but of course there's a lot of ozone absorption there. But there's still a lot, there is still some water vapor cooling. Um, and then we see the progressive increase in how much water vapor is affecting the brightness temperature. But the three big water vapor channels are here. Same thing, you, you can do the same thing with SO2. So 7.3, in addition to detecting water vapor, will also detect SO2. And of course, the challenge is to separate them. 
if you have a volcano that's emitting a lot of SO2, you'll see it in the 7.3. I showed you an animation last yesterday of, of water vapor from Bogslov, I think, in the Aleutian Islands. And it had a nice signal in the 7.3 because of SO2, but also because of water vapor. And then 8.4 also has some SO2 absorption uh, in, that, in that wavelength as well. So you can ca calculate the brightness temperature difference due to SO2 and here. <coughs> and so we have it really focused in, this, in the uh, low level water vapor band and also in the uh, uh, 8.4 micron. And notice this is really a pretty high concentration, 1,000 dobs in units of SO2. If you had just a minor burp, there wouldn't be much, um, there, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be much of, a, of an effect here at all due to SO2. So what can water vapor tell you? Well, I like water vapor because it, you can make a guess when you look at the water vapor about the atmospheric circulation. So if I were to ask you, you know, where is the low pressure system at some, where's the cyclonic circulation or the anticyclonic circulation? You can see, you can trace out a circulation that's going like this in the water vapor. Of course, it's a lot easier if it's animating. I'm not going to blame the animation here, though, because this, I know this is a still image. This is not meant to animate. Because if you animate it, well, then the, uh, it's pretty obvious exactly what the uh, circulation is doing. But you see the... Uh, you can trace out a nice circulation here where we have dry air coming up into Texas. You can do the same thing with the low-level water vapor as well. It shows up a little bit better. Um, maybe this isn't a great enhancement. But again, at what level, you know, if I were to ask you, what, what level am I sensing there in the atmosphere? It's hard to tell that because it changes based on the, both the temperature and the amount of water vapor in the air. And that's what these weighting functions will tell you. And I touched on those a little bit yesterday. And I'll do, do a little bit more in-depth today. So this is a website I showed you yesterday. This is a real-time website where at each of the sounding locations, you would click on it and it would show the real-time clear sky weighting function computed. Um, of course, if, like, if you click on this one, I think that's Aberdeen, South Dakota, it gives you the clear sky weighting function, but of course, it's cloudy there. So really, all, this, all the information in Aberdeen is coming from the cloud top. Um, so, again, these are clear sky, clear sky weighting functions, so make sure you understand if it's clear or not. So, and as I said, it includes Mexican stations. This is something I showed you yesterday. You'll notice this is animating. So these are the same kind of files I was in my other presentation, but these are smaller, so I think it's a memory issue on this particular laptop. That's my guess. So if you have a good laptop, or have a laptop with better memory than this particular one, uh, you should be able to see the animations from this morning's talks. Okay, this is comparing a fairly moist atmosphere with a fairly dry atmosphere. Again, just reinforcing the idea that if you have a dry atmosphere, you see a lot more information from lower in the atmosphere when you're looking at water vapor channels. And also, as you go from the 6.1 to the 7.3, the peak level that you're looking at is also changing with time. This is what's nice about the um, water vapor channels in, on the AB on the ABI bands 8, 9, and 10 is you're getting moisture information from different levels in the atmosphere. And that's important to know for, for example, convective stability. So you can do this for theoretical atmospheres, which is a little bit easier to do. Um, so you can change the band you're looking at, the atmosphere that's being used, the zenith angle, the column water, the moisture, or the, uh, and the skin temperature. So I'll just show, new, show some examples to see how these affect what the brightness temperature that the water vapor is giving you. So here we have a standard tropical atmosphere, 3.9 microns and 6.2 microns. So it's just showing you the weighting functions for the different channels. And you'll notice most of these are window channels. So here's channels, a band seven, the 3.9 micron. It's getting all its, most of its information from down near the surface. Then the water vapor channels are giving you information from the middle of the atmosphere. Then we're back to the, a window channel, 8.6. Here we have the 9.6, which is getting information from the surface, but there's also a contribution from the ozone up in the stratosphere. It's hard to, just, it's hard to differentiate between the two of those in the signal too. So. Um, 
It's called the ozone. Ch it's called the ozone band. That's the nickname because it's in a region where ozone absorption occurs. It's not necessarily something you can use to detect ozone. So here we have band 13. Again, most of the information from the surface. Uh, band 14 would show the same thing. I don't know why the. I don't know why I didn't put an image in there. Um, band 15 is showing a signal from mostly at the surface, and band 16 you'll notice you're getting some mid-tropospheric mid or lower tropospheric information in the CO2 channel. So here we have all of them put together. This is for both ABI and AHI, which is the sounder or the imager that's on Himawari 8 and 9, if you're looking at imagery out over the Pacific. And one thing you'll notice here is you have these three water vapor channels giving you information in the middle of the troposphere, but all the other channels are mostly giving you information near the surface. So if you wanted to use um, ABI to tell you what the temperature was in the middle of the uh, in the middle of the troposphere. That's hard to do. There's just not a lot of observations there. Most of the temperature information is coming from the surface. So did you notice most ABI channels are window channels? They see the surface. Um, this is different from the GOES 13, 14, 15 sounder that has those CO2 channels around four and a half and 14.4 microns. Um, if you're looking for temperature information, you get a little bit from it of it from the water vapor, and you get a little bit of it from the CO2 channels, but that's about it. So if you're interested in the temperature structure in the mid-troposphere, and you want to use the ABI, good luck. Um, it's very difficult to get a useful signal. So here are the ones that give you information. Mid-tropospheric information from the water vapor channel, lower tropospheric and stratospheric information in the, in the ozone channel, and some lower tropospheric information in the CO2 channel. <clears throat> now what if you warm the surface? So that's what this skin temperature adjustment is. So let's make the surface 10K warmer. Everything else is the same. Um, how will this change the computed brightness temperature that you're seeing? So this would be a quiz if I were uh, teaching you in a class. So here we have skin temperature adjustment, 0 Kelvin plus 10 Kelvin. And you'll notice um, the, the uh, weighting function looks fairly similar. The brightness temperature is almost increased by 10 Kelvin. I think that's, what, 8 point, no. Yeah, 8.8 .8 Kelvin, 8.8 8 .8 Celsius. Uh, maybe, I don't know, my addition is a little foggy, I guess. Um, but most of the skin temperature change has been picked up by band 7, which is very sensitive to low-level temperature. If you look at band 8, oops, band 8, nothing has changed. So you've changed the skin temperature from 0 Kelvin to 10 Kelvin, brightness temperature is the same, telling you that surface information doesn't go up to the, is not detected by the water vapor channel. So you can have Quite a lot going on at the surface in terms of warming things, but it's not going to give you any signal um, at the satellite. Same thing with band 10. We still have the same temperature here, same weighting function. Now, if this were a bit drier atmosphere, um, band 10 might have a better chance of seeing some kind of change in the skin temperature. Band 13, temperature has gone up. The skin temperature has gone up 10 Kelvin, but you'll notice the, the uh, change in Brightness temperature um, is only 6.9 Celsius, so a little bit less than for band 7. So again, telling you that band 7 is giving you more information at the surface than this window channel. And if I showed you this band 14, um, so here we have the skin temperature. Uh, I don't know what happened here. I must, I was, must have messed up putting these in here. Uh, so, but band 14 has a similar change. Um, again, that's why it's useful for fire detection because when you change the fire, when you change the brightness, when you change the skin temperature as you would with the fire, it shows up much more strongly in band seven, and that and that proportion between band seven and fourteen is, is what's used to say, okay, there's a fire going on there. Okay, so that's the change in the skin temperature. We can change the zenith angle. So Mexico benefits because the zenith angle, because you're near the subsatellite point doesn't change too much, but I'm still going to show you what happens when you go from a zenith angle of 0 to 45. 
Um, band seven, uh, with a zenith angle of zero, here's that brightness temperature of 23.6. There's been a little bit of cooling as you go um, away from the sub-satellite point. So as you scan farther away from the sub-satellite point, you're scanning more and more through the colder upper troposphere, and that's going to affect your brightness temperature. And this, is, this effect varies by band. Um, band 12, the ozone channel, has a big effect. So we're zenith angle of zero, brightness temperature of 19. When you have a zenith angle of 45, the brightness temperatures drop down to minus six. So the zenith angle changes, so you need to know where you are because the brightness temperature you're sensing is a function of zenith angle. And here's band 16, the CO2 channel also has a big change. And you can, can, here's a little chart. So we are looking at 45, which is about in here, but we have all the different channels and how the, for the identical atmosphere, the only thing that's different is the, is the zenith angle, how it's scanning through the atmosphere, and we have the cooling that's going to be apparent. So for water vapor information, where's the level? For a dry atmosphere, it's from lower in the atmosphere. If you're far from the sub-satellite point, the information comes from higher in the atmosphere. If it's a longer wavelength, that is 7.3 versus 6.19, it's from lower in the atmosphere. Um, so when is the, the water vapor channel can be a window channel if you have a very dry atmosphere. So what does, here's, here's an example of um, that water vapor channel I showed you earlier, and we're looking at Corpus Christi here. This, that's where the cursor is on, and it has the brightness temperatures for both um, the 6.19 and the 7.34. So it's a readout coming from AWIPS. AWIPS tells you the brightness temperature. And the question is, what level is that at? Now you could just look at numerical model data and say, okay, I know from the GFS this morning, or whatever model you use, that minus 31 point C is at 416 millibars or something. Um, but you can also use these weighting functions. So here is the weighting function from that day and time at Corpus Christi. And we have the, again, these are clear sky observations. The upper level water vapor has most of the information, or the peak in the information is coming from around 329 millibars. Um, and here we have a brightness temperature. Mid levels coming from 340, peaking at 344. Low levels peaking at 442. So um, if this was a case where, as it says, if, as dry air moves over Corpus Christi, the peaks in the water vapor functions should drop because there's less water vapor absorption, so the satellite should be able to see farther down into the atmosphere. So there's the total precipitable water, 1.34 inches on this particular day. Then here we have another, another t it's at 12, 24 hours later, it's gotten a little more moist, 1.41, but you'll notice all the weighting function peaks have dropped. So I just told you that if there's more moisture, they should go up but that has not happened. But if you look at the sounding, which is in here, in this particular sounding, we have a lot of upper, there's some cirrus at the top. Um, so it's, uh, there's a lot of moisture at the top of this sounding, and that's what's uh, helping to have these uh, weighting functions peak a little bit higher. And 24 hours later, the upper levels have dried out a lot. So you're seeing more information from lower down in the atmosphere. So you have more moisture as measured by total precipitable water but the peaks have dropped because the upper troposphere is drier. So this is, I hope I'm getting across the point that um, understanding exactly where these peaks are gonna be is kind of complicated. It's not just the moisture, but it's where the moisture is located in the vertical too. Okay, so not a lot of moisture about the boundary layer, which is where all the moisture is, but one of the, one of the level two products coming from GO-16 is total precipitable water. And that's how you can tell where moisture is in the atmosphere or where there is dryness. So here we have an image of um, water vapor. This is the low-level water vapor. And my question for you would be, where are the moisture gradients? And of course, it's a trick question by now. I hope you think you're th saying, well, I don't know because I don't know anything about the surface moisture distribution based on this particular image. But the total precipitable water is shown here. Um, so we have a nice moisture gradient here where we're going from something around 
more than an inch to less to something around a half an inch. And again, if you look at the water vapor in that region, you really don't see any gradients. So the total precipitable water level two product is an important thing to use so you understand exactly where the deep moisture is in the atmosphere. Um, so I do have the water vapor. Okay, total precipitable water, this is a obviously a clear sky only product. So where we have clouds, I've put in where the I've put in the water vapor. Uh, just uh, and just underlying the total precipitable water with the water vapor so you can see some of the features I'm in the water vapor. So I, I made it a grayscale though, so the color scales between the two don't start to uh, uh, blow your mind. Okay, um, changing topics a little bit to volcanoes. Um, as I say, 8.4 microns and 7.3 are both sensitive to SO2, so they can be used to detect um, volcanic emissions. But there's a, there's a lot of difficulty in there. Um, this is, a, this is an, uh, a, a graph, a fairly complicated graph, comparing the absorption of upwelling radiation at 8.5 microns versus around 11 microns. So energy that's coming up from, from, um, from up below is not, if you have some kind of cirrus cloud or water cloud, it, it penetrates it fairly quickly. Um, whereas around 11 microns, there's more absorption. So the energy from underneath is being intercepted at 11 microns, so it'll be a colder temperature, it's absorbed and re-emitted, versus at 8.5 microns where it passes through mostly unadulterated by the clouds. So the brightness temperature with cirrus clouds will be warmer um, at 8.5 than it will be at 11 microns, and that complicates how you can infer what's going on with a volcano if the volcano is producing a thin cirrus or it's occurring underneath a thin cirrus if there's, for example, jet stream cirrus above it. So here's some examples. This is a GOES 16 imagery with Popo Kappa. I can only say Popo. Um, so we have in the blue band, you see a little bit of the ash plume is showing up fairly nicely. Popo Kappa, ka, 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 ka. I have to see it written down because then I know where the P and the T are. Um, this is band four, the 0.47. The 0.64, in, in this particular case, the uh, cloud shows up mostly the same. You do notice between 0.64 and 0.47, typically 0.47 is a little, has a little hazier look to it because there's more scattering at that wavelength. So um, the atmosphere doesn't quite look, it, it's, harder to, it's harder to distinguish between some land features. Some of that is the difference in resolution because 0.64 is half kilometer and 0.47 is one kilometer but some is also due to the physics of scattering in the atmosphere. Here we have the 8.4 micron, and it does show up fairly nicely um, in here, but it's also showing up nicely in the 11.2 micron, very similar look to it, which tells me that uh, maybe some of this, maybe a lot of this cooling, I mean, there's part of here, part of it right there, doesn't really show up in the 11.2, so I'm thinking maybe that's an SO2 plume, but there's SO2 and water vapor being emitted by this volcano, so it's very difficult to interpret it um, correctly, for me at least. There are probably experts who know how to do this. Here's another example with, uh, uh, it's, the, it's the one in Guatemala that went off yeah, in, uh, in early February. So here we have the 8.4, here we have the 11.2, they look very similar, and if you take the difference field, um, there are regions in here, but again, this is probably more controlled by thin ice clouds and not by SO2. So I question whether there's a lot of SO2 being emitted from this volcano, but I don't know because I'm not a volcanic expert. Um, this is one that's supposed to be animating. This is a huge file, um, and I think it's too big, but it, it shows you how the volcanic activity is visible in all of these bands if it's... Um, impressive enough, and this one was, this was a pretty impressive um, eruption on uh, June 3rd down in Guatemala. There is a website that is, if you are interested in volcanic monitoring, um, this is a website put 
together by Mike Pavalonis and some of his colleagues in NOAA. Mike Pavalonis also works at, uh, in Wisconsin. Um, and he is the person who has developed the uh, volcanic detection algorithm for, for both GOES-16 and for the polar orbiter. So he's a better, um, I trust his interpretive skills of volcanic eruptions way more than mine. And he has this over here. So if you go to this particular website, volcano.ssc.wist.edu, um, there's a link there for satellite imagery. Um, and then you click on that and you can choose the sector. Um, so there's a sector over Mexico. There's a sector over Kilauea. There, there are sectors over many uh, common volcanic eruption zones or, or over common, commonly erupting volcanoes. So you can choose an instrument, a satellite. From, so you choose GOES-16 and ABI, for example, image types, and then an end, end date, end time, and a date range. So you choose all of those things, and it'll throw, it'll put out, put out an animation or something that looks like this, where we have a false color imagery, where it's looking at the 12 minus 11, 11 minus 8.5, and 11 micron. For GOES-16, that's actually 12.2, 11.3, 11.2. So they kind of truncate them. But there are similar channels on, on VIRS, which is why that's used. Um, so after you choose that, you, you get imagery that you can interpret. And this is, a, this is a, true, a false color imagery. So when there's something happening, you get a very unusual color in there. Um, so if you're used to looking at the false color imagery, the volcanic eruption will pop right out at you. Um, so how do you observe it with GOES-16? Well, here's an animation. Um, of, this is Fuego over Guatemala, so we have ash, ash and dust cloud height from that particular eruption, and it shows the uh, observations from GO-16. And here we have the estimates from the satellite of the ash and dust height. Um, and in the background is the brightness temperature from 11 microns, 11.2 microns. So it's, it's a way to just get animations or imagery when a volcano is erupting. Now, how do you know when the volcano is erupting? You can also sign up at this website for um, alerts that will be sent right to you by phone or by email. Um, I will say that the, the VAC people at the Volcanic uh, Something Activity Centers um, are monitoring this, this, the satellite imagery and they probably know more than anybody because that's their job. So it's I would trust an alert from a VAC versus just something that a person looking at this imagery would look at. So accurate interpretation of satellite with respect to volcanic activity, that's a benefit of that. Because I would add, if, it, if, it, if we weren't talking about the benefits, I would just say it's very difficult for this first point. But it's not difficult for the experts who are using this site at the VAC. And, uh, that's all I have today. Well, I'm standing by waiting for the volcano to erupt in the middle of the room. So I'll entertain any questions. Except I don't have my, I turned in my, so wait one minute, oh. When I thought we were moving, I turned in my, thanks. Preguntas. Eh, bueno, entonces, pues un aplauso por favor para el doctor. Eh, ahora ya tenemos la parte de la comida, en donde vamos a repartir los boletos en cada una de las salidas. Un, una cuestión más. De regreso ya no hay más presentaciones. La única parte que falta es la visita a la NOT. Yo no sé si todos están interesados. ¿Quiénes? ¿Pueden levantar la mano para saber eh, los grupos bien arriba? Ok, si somos más de 20, ¿no? Ok, entonces van a ser dos grupos, porque no pueden entrar más de 20 personas y dura aproximadamente 20 minutos la, la visita. Entonces tenemos primero un grupo en donde, digo, por una cortesía de nuestros visitantes extranjeros, van a estar en el primer eh, bloque 
y el resto pues ya entra 20 minutos después. Entonces yo creo que para cuestiones de logística mejor nos vemos aquí y de aquí ya armamos los grupos y nos vamos al laboratorio Lanot que está aquí yo a dos minutos caminando. Pues buen provecho y muchas gracias. Ah, quien se quede sin boleto se acerca conmigo por favor para que resolvamos el tema. Yo.